The year is 1938. Benny Goodman plays Carnegie Hall's first ever jazz concert. Katharine Hepburn and Cary Grant star in Bringing Up Baby. And John W. Campbell Jr. writes the stunning sci-fi novella, Who Goes There? Flash forward to 1982, Olivia Newton-John's Physical is the top of the charts, and John Carpenter directs The Thing, because super gross practical monster effects have come far enough to really make a worthy adaptation of the novella. And now the year is 2018, two guys that make YouTube videos decided to skip over 1951's The Thing from Another World, as well as 2011's prequel to The Thing, which was also called The Thing. So without further ado or pointless timelining, it's time to ask, what's the difference? Right off the bat, broad strokes, the book and movie are both about a team of researchers in Antarctica who are beset by an alien capable of imitating other life forms, of disguising itself as any other creature at once. They're both also set in present day. For the book, that means 1938, and the movie, that means 1982. So there are a handful of differences in available technology sprinkled throughout, i.e. this chess computer who, according to McCready, is... But, by and large, the setting of the two are the same. The characters vary only slightly from page to screen as well. For example, McCready, the main character in both mediums, is described in the book as something from a forgotten myth. A bronze, statue-given life. The station's meteorologist and second-in-command McCready is stoic and purposeful and just bronze, man. Seriously, Campbell frequently describes him as bronze. And movie McCready is Kurt Russell, which is nothing to sneeze at, but the disheveled, long hair, bearded, and boozy helicopter pilot McCready is nowhere near the classical statue described in the novella. Other characters, however, resemble their book counterparts more closely. There's Blair, described in the book as a little bald, pated biologist, and played in the movie by a little bald, pated Wilford Brimley, who stays largely the same. Commander Gary, meanwhile, runs the book's research station with a bit more respect than his movie counterpart. The book's research team admires Gary, while in the movie, he's belittled by some of his crew and even made to look a little blubbery at times. Some of this can be chalked up to the tenor of a pseudo-military operation in pre-World War II America versus one in post-Vietnam America, but it's still an interesting difference. The movie borrows several more character names from the book, but not many more characteristics. For example, there's a Norris and a Dr. Copper in both mediums, but it's hard to even tell if they have much in common. This is largely due to the fact that the book has a much larger cast. There are 37 people at the research station, as well as over 70 dogs and 5 cows, as opposed to the movie's dozen men and single team of sled dogs. The men in the book, outside of a few main characters, are given very little to do to distinguish themselves. Moving on to the story, the movie opens with a spaceship landing on Earth, so no mystery here. Just setting something up for Predator to borrow five years later and establishing clearly we're dealing with an alien. But it quickly moves on to this mysterious chase through the snow, with these Norwegians in a helicopter trying to kill a dog for reasons unbeknownst to anybody. Notes to the dog, however, is that it's not a dog, it's the thing. And now it's found its way into the research station. In the book, the alien is already sitting in the station, frozen in a big chunk of ice. The early part of the book is dedicated to McCready explaining how they came to find the thing in the first place. They were out investigating some strange magnetic readings, because remember, they're sciencing down there in the South Pole when they stumbled across a spaceship and this alien popsicle not 10 paces away. They also accidentally blow up the spaceship, but they do feel really bad about it. I mean, they were just trying to clear some ice, but McCready totally understood that maybe they just blew up all kinds of mind-expanding alien technologies that could have literally saved mankind, but, you know, the ship blew up. In the movie, The Thing is still the dog when McCready and Copper go investigate the Norwegian camp. When they return from the ruined Norwegian station with the charred remains of a mid-transformation thing, the thing that was disguised as a dog begins to reveal itself. And cue the goopy 80s body horror. It's only after the first attack that McCready, Copper, and Fuchs head back out and find the crashed alien ship and the carved out block of ice, and they really understand what they're dealing with. In the book, meanwhile, there's some debate about what to do with the frozen alien. They can make out its appearance through the ice. It's got three red eyes and worm-like blue hair, so it's freaking some dudes out. Plus, Norris claims he had nightmares ever since he looked into those three red eyes and has the feeling that the thing is actually telepathic. So while Norris, a physicist, is worried about what alien microbes they might thaw with the beast, Blair, the biologist, is antsy to get a look. Ultimately, Blair gets his way, and the thing is allowed to thaw. They just lean it against the wall overnight, and oh, would you look at that, by morning the thing is gone. 
The Thing's first attack plays out the same way in both mediums. It's in the kennels, and the entire research station is crowded around McCready and a flamethrower. Barclay, one of the other 36 guys from the book, fashions a weird little cattle prod out of a few pieces of wood and some electrified wires, and boy does the Thing hate that. But after the first attack, Blair seems to have a pretty accurate grasp on what the thing is and how it works. In the movie, though, Blair spends time dissecting everything, analyzing blood samples, and in one of those bits of 80s technology sprinkled throughout the film, there's a pretty hilarious computer model of how the thing's cells attack other cells, and with just a few more keystrokes, how quickly the thing is going to take over the Earth. 27,000 hours? Well, that's just 1,125 days! And what a dramatic computer, ellipses and everything, sheesh. Either way, both book and movie Blair go crazy, convinced none of them can leave the station without also risking bringing the thing back to the rest of the world. He disables communications and transportation, stranding the crew on the ice, and they respond by locking him away from the rest of the men. In both versions, they're pretty certain one or more of them are things, and trust gets thrown right out the window. <laughs> So to tell who's who, in the book they devise a blood test where they mix human blood with dog blood, and they let that marinate for five to six days, and then test the crew's blood against that to see if they're really a thing. Which, well, it didn't really make sense when I was reading it, and apparently it doesn't make sense within the narrative because the test doesn't work at all. Ultimately, McCready ends up resorting to the same hot wire test his movie counterpart uses. Thinking that every part of a thing acts independently, a thing's blood will try to defend itself. In the movie, we get this scene, where Palmer's blood reacts, and then, boom! Rad creature effects. I mean, look at this! The 80s were awesome! You got this, the fly, reanimator, come on! Practical lore is just so cool. But it's just the one guy who's a thing. The hot wire test proves everyone else is still human. In the book, the whole station, all 36 guys, except of course Blair, who's still, you know, locked away, stand in one room together, getting their blood tested one at a time. And 14 of them come back positive. And each time somebody's blood reacts, the rest of the room descends on them, literally killing them with their bare hands. In a twisted little detail, the men begin to grin sadistically as they take out the things. Even McCready seems to get a thrill out of killing the things, like a sense of relief with how violently they have taken the upper hand on the Sneaking up on the end, in the movie, they head out to test Blair's blood only to find him missing. A few loose floorboards reveal that he'd tunneled underneath the shack he was being held in and began building some type of ship with spare parts from the vehicles he'd been sabotaging around the station. Book Blair is found in a similar situation, only it wasn't Blair anymore. The Thing had dropped the whole disguise completely and was just straight up looking like things look. After dispatching it in the customary way, they discovered that the thing had also managed to create both atomic power and an anti-gravity backpack while being left alone for only a week. That's leagues ahead of what Thing Blair slapped together in the movie. We should say, the ending of these stories is probably the biggest difference. The final survivors in the movie realize the thing is just trying to freeze itself again, to wait for more unsuspecting humans to arrive so it can make another escape. Six hours, it'll be a hundred below in here. Well, that's suicide! Not for that thing. And while their book counterparts certainly consider the fact that they may not make it out alive, Movie McCready and Co.'s cold acceptance of that fact drives the entire climax of the film. With McCready and Childs left shivering in the cold, the film ends with an incredible and now iconic ambiguity. It's not a question of will our heroes survive this ordeal, but which one of these guys is the thing? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? See what happens. The book, however, is a pretty straightforward happy ending. McCready figures they caught the thing maybe half an hour before it was ready to leave, so hey, good timing there. Plus, they're satisfied the hot needle test was conclusive, and none of the other 20 some odd men remaining on the base are things, so chalk this one up for the good guys. Case closed, nothing ambiguous here, we totally won. The end. That's it for this episode of What's the Difference, but let us know in the comments what your favorite super goopy practical monster effects are, and be sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more What's the Difference.